everyone! Today I'm going to give a quick lesson on how to annotate a text. A text can be anything from a poem to a book to your textbook in school, an instruction manual or an employee handbook, anything. Any text that you want to come back to later and you want to quickly find those key important details about it, you annotate. I um, mean, and annotating is a very important process when we're writing, when we're researching, and when we're studying. So it's a very valuable skill to develop, and to, to develop it as early as possible makes college and work and any professional or creative endeavor that you might need to do research for or anything where you would need to read anything, really, makes it 100% smoother. So, let's get into it. We annotate to make note of important details in what we're reading. We also want to record our initial reactions to what we're reading, and we, we want to use it to study. So those are all important things in college, in, in your introduction to college composition classes, any kind of class like that, but also, like I said, in the workforce. If your boss has sent you the updated employee handbook or a memo, anything like that might be something you would want to annotate. And even if you're not officially using it for studying, for a test, even if you're not being tested on it, annotating makes it easier to go back and, like I said, find those important details. Um, Sherry Nist of Georgia State University has said that annotating and underlining serves a dual function. Students can isolate key ideas at the time of their initial reading and then study those ideas later as they prepare for tests. So that's her perspective on what annotating and underlining should all be about. Um, even though she gears her that quote and her paper towards students, I really see it as something that everybody may need at some point or another. You may be following along with me on my presentation. I hope you are. So, in the academic world, there's a lot of debate about what the best or one true most effective means of annotating is for students who are studying. And, you know, you know, some people say that underlining is bad or highlighting is bad or this other technique is bad. And I think, I personally think that that's not the right way to describe it. I think we need to specify that any method, any technique you want to use is okay, but you've got to be careful about it. If you're passively highlighting, you know, you're just highlighting and you're not paying attention, you're not making any meaning out of it, then it's not going to be useful to you when you go back. So you need to remember some important things while you're annotating to make sure that it's effective. I think that most important thing is that we should not be highlighting the whole page or underlining the whole page or making marks that we can't go back and immediately recognize. So if you're underlining something and you can't look right at that underline and immediately know what it means without even reading the text, then there wasn't much point in underlining. The idea is that you should immediately be able to look at what you've marked and know what it means without even reading the text, in my opinion. So, you should be pointing out main ideas, words you need to look up in the dictionary, things that confuse you or things that you want to ask questions about, things that stand out as interesting or contradictory in any kind of way. If you're writing a research paper, you might want to mark things that seem quote-worthy that you would want to quote in your paper or things that you would want to paraphrase in your own paper as supporting evidence for your own ideas. And anything else that stands out to you as the reader that you want to come back to later. All those things should be annotated. And to make sure that that's effective, you need to make meaning with your symbols. So if you want to use highlighters, that's fine. But color code them. Always use the yellow highlighter for the same thing. Always use a blue highlighter for something else. Maybe every time you take out a text, yellow highlights, are main ideas. Maybe blue highlights are questions, things that confuse you. Maybe green highlights are words you need to look up in the dictionary. 
maybe red highlights or ideas you disagree with. Whatever um, representation you're making with these colors or underlines or symbols, be consistent with it and learn your legend, your key to what the colors or symbols or lines mean. If you learn your, your own annotating code, then when you look at any, any notes, any book, anything that you've annotated, and you see something marked in red highlighter, you automatically know what that is, even without reading it. And that's what I think matters for being effective. You can automatically jump right to any book that you've annotated, and everything in red, you know what it's going to be. Does that make sense? That's what I think is the key when we're annotating. So whether you feel like highlighting is your thing, or color coding is your thing, or sticky notes are your thing, whatever it is, make it consistent and use it to make meaning. And speaking of sticky notes, if you're annotating something that doesn't belong to you, a textbook you've rented or a book you've borrowed, be courteous and absolutely use sticky notes. Don't mark in somebody else's book. Just be polite. Like I said, color coding and highlighting are popular. I feel like color coding and highlighting are, are good for differentiating between different types of things. Like I said, make those colors each mean something different. Something else that people might use is underlining and using brackets around blocks of text. If you need a bigger block, like I said, don't use a whole page of just a whole block, but uh, if you need a heftier chunk to be marked up, maybe use brackets. Uh, the, the problem with highlighting the whole page or putting brackets around the whole page or underlining the whole page is that it's as if there's no difference between the way it was before you annotated it. It's still just the whole block of text that's been marked now. There's no significance to it. You've still got to read it and try to go back and figure out what you thought you meant. Um, so it, it wastes time. So unless for some reason you wanted to underline that whole page maybe because you knew you wanted to make a photocopy of this page to share with someone else, otherwise don't do it. You know what, if you can make a significant meaning out of the whole page, that's fair enough, but usually we don't. Something else that's very popular are symbols. Something else that's very popular are symbols. I'll try and show you my symbols here. So. Here are some symbols that this little diagram shows. There's check marks, stars, question marks, plus and minus signs. All kinds of things could be used. And those are just a few. Use whatever symbol you want to use. Like I said, just make meaning out of it. This person made this diagram of their key of what each symbol means. And as long as they're using those symbols consistently, it should be effective. We're going to practice in just a second with a poem. And I know some people are intimidated by poetry and some people don't like poetry. But this is just a brief example we can use. You can use it for everything and anything that you need to read. People annotate their newspapers to find job listings and babysitters and, you know, to write their own letter to the editors. It could be anything. You've got three important steps, I believe, in the process of annotating. I believe the first step should be to read it quickly or to skim your text. To get the gist of it first. Then I think we should go back and read closely and annotate on the second reading. Then I think the third step, which is the most important, is to go back and review your annotations, whether it's immediately or later on when you're studying. If you make the marks and then don't go back to it and use it somehow, there was no point. With all of that in mind, let's annotate Pablo Neruda's If You Forget Me. It's a poem that I really enjoy by a poet that I really enjoy. So, like I said, first step is to read quickly. So let me read it to you first, and then we'll practice annotating together. Here it goes. If You Forget Me by Pablo Neruda. I want you to know one thing. You know how this is. If I look at the crystal moon, at the red branch of the slow autumn at my window, if I touch near the fire, the impalpable ash or the wrinkled body of the log. Everything carries me to you, as if everything that exists, aromas, lights, metals, were little boats that sail toward those isles of yours that wait for me. Well, now, if little by little you stop loving me, 
I shall stop loving you little by little. If suddenly you forget me, do not look for me, for I shall already have forgotten you. If you think it long and mad, the wind of banners that passes through my life, and you decide to leave me at the shore of the heart where I have roots, remember that on that day, at that hour, I shall lift my arms and make my roots, and my roots will set sail to seek another land. But if each day, each hour, you feel that you are destined for me with implacable sweetness, if each day a flower climbs up to your lips to seek me, ah, oh, my love, ah, oh, my own, in me all that fire is repeated, in me nothing is extinguished or forgotten. My love feeds on your love, beloved, and as long as you live, it will be in your arms without leaving mine. So, let's take a few minutes and annotate this. Whatever stands out to you. You don't have to be an expert in poetry. Just mark what stands out to you. I'm going to do it too. I've got a purple pen, and I'm going to be making notes and annotations right alongside you. So let's do it, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss and share what we found memorable. annotations here let's let's go over them so I just use my one pen for this so I use the combination of lines and squares and writing so my squares are words I didn't know I'm pretty darn sure that I mispronounced this one implacable implacable I'm not sure I'm gonna look it up in the dictionary and find out and palpable, I know I said it right because I've heard it before, but I'm not exactly sure what it means. Then, my underlines are words and phrases that sounded beautiful to me. So, crystal moon, crystal moon, red branch, slow autumn, and at the shore of the heart where I have roots. Those are all really beautiful to me. Um, you don't have to know much about literary analysis or poetic devices that we don't have to know right now what techniques those might be employing to, to sound beautiful, but they just sound beautiful. They they speak to my, my romantic heart. <laughs> um, so I, I underlined them. As long as I'm consistent that my underlines mean that same thing, beautiful words or beautiful images, it's fair game. So then on the side here in the margins, I've got some really sloppy notes to myself. So here they go. I feel like the poem starts out sad and then goes happy. This is if, if you forget me, I'm gonna immediately forget you. But if you don't, if you remember me and you keep loving me, my love's gonna last forever. So I, I feel like it's kind of a sad to happy transition. I also felt like it was bittersweet. Um, and I felt like there was resentment. This narrator or speaker is going to immediately forget the person that they love if that person forgets them. It's not going to be a slow burn. It's not going to be any grieving. It's just immediately. Don't look for me. I'm going to have forgotten you. And, and that's pretty atypical. I'd say a lot of people do not switch like that and say, bye, you're gone. You're cut loose. Forget about it. You know, most people aren't like that. So that, that sense of resentment uh, really spoke to me, really felt very strong to me. I feel like this poem could be about lost love or unrequited love. Maybe those are some of the major themes. And then the last thing that I wanted to write that I noticed is that the writer Pablo Neruda is using you. I want you to know one thing. So, when you're reading it, is it me? Am I? I want you to know one thing. Is it you? Am I talking directly to you? Is the speaker talking directly to you? That's what it feels like. Um, and, and we can call, in poetry, we can call that an ode. You don't have to know that, but 
I thought that was interesting that he's not directing it to her or she or a specific lover. You know, he or they, you know, he's not directing it to a specific lover, it's to you, the reader. Which is interesting. It, it puts you in the shoes of that person who might forget. So, I'd love to know what your annotation ideas were, what stood out to you. Um, there is no right or wrong answer, really, when it comes to what you annotated. You may not have picked the same things that I picked, and that's totally okay. It's not a, just like there's not a right or wrong style of annotation, I think there's not a right or wrong answer to what we annotate. It's more of a matter of what's relevant and what's not relevant, or what's more relevant and what's less relevant. If you're being tested and you've got a study guide, and you know that something specific is not going to be tested, don't worry about it right now. Don't annotate it right now. Save it for later. But you should absolutely annotate everything that you know you're going to be tested on. Um, when it's a poem or a book and it's for a book report or an analysis essay or when it's a lab report and you've got to make a presentation about it, it needs to be those key things, those important things for that work you're doing. Those other things are not less important in the grand scheme of things, but if they're not important for the work you're doing right now, save it for later. Okay? All right. I hope this has been helpful. I, I hope you wrote along with me and enjoyed the poem, and I'll see you next time. Bye!